Welcome back, traders and investors, to our final interview of the week and with Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson. He's Chief Investment Officer of Lemelson Capital Management. You are going to hear an interview with one of the world's top hedge fund managers. How are you doing today, Reverend? Glory be to God. All is well. It's really a, an honor to be back uh, on your show and, and to have a chance to speak with you and Brianna. Well, Thanks for the invite. We love we love your input here. And uh, the first uh, first thing I want to touch on here is the Greek debt crisis. And uh, uh, you're familiar with that. You're half Greek. You've lived over there for a few years. Uh, no one really seems to know what the resolution is going to be to this crisis. Could you just give us, uh, I guess, an insider's look at the Greek debt crisis? Sure, Joel. Uh, you're right. I think only God knows ultimately what the resolution is going to be. And everyone has an opinion. I mean, hedge funds have been involved over the years, and you've got the Troika, the IMF, the ECB, and the rest of the Eurozone. Um, it, it's no secret that the root of the problem has really been that, you know, Greece lost the capacity to, inf to inflate uh, asset prices through um, devaluing their own currency. Uh, you know, during the Great Recession, which was a global event, the U.S. was able to respond with about $1.3 trillion in quantitative easing, bond buying. Greece lacked the ability to do that. The result was that once it was revealed, of course, that their debt-to-GDP ratios are much higher than anyone thought, and there were these misrepresentations statistically, uh, it really made the situation very bad for Greece. Uh, private debt markets were no longer an option, and the, com the country just went right from one recession to another. It's really been a depression in Greece for about seven or eight years, uh, and it's really a tragic human situation. Uh, you know, living in Greece in the early 1980s as a child, I had such fond memories of Greece, and it was really one of the safest countries in Europe, frankly. And um, the cost of living was very low, and the Greek society as a whole had an aversion to debt, as hard as it is to believe today. Um, but, you know, through this financial engineering, which the other half of me as an American I feel regretful for, it's really our top banks in the U.S. that taught sort of Greece how to toy with their balance sheet and uh, disguising a lot of that debt through currency conversions. That resulted in creating a sort of addiction to spending and debt. Um, but the, the criticism of Greece as dividing off more they can choose, spending more than they can afford, there's another side of that, that equation, of course, which is who are the lenders? The lenders are, are also have been a bit reckless. But, you know, my hope and prayer would be that Greece would eventually do an orderly uh, default, leave the Eurozone, uh, and, and reinstitute the drachma, its historical currency. They really need those currency controls. Um, to deal with this crisis. And, um, you know, but, you know, if there's a silver lining in all this, I, I got to tell you, um, part of the root of this problem is that the Greek people as a whole are suffering almost from a, a latent Stockholm syndrome. I mean, they've almost fallen in love with their abusers. I mean, they don't want to leave the Eurozone on the one hand because they feel like it's a matter of Greek national pride. And pride being, of course, the ultimate form of myopsy. But at the same time, it's, it's really subjugation to the Germans, if you will, and, and the Northern European countries. Do you, think, really do you think there's any chance that they're just going to walk? I mean, if you think about it, you know, they're. I mean, are they ever, ever going to climb out of their debt with the well, other I day? think it's, it's, a, it's a sociological phenomenon more than anything else. There's no question they need to do that. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela or something like that. I mean, they need to walk away from this debt. It's, it's not sustainable. Greece does not have the productivity of the GDP to maintain these debts. Um, and I think once they get past the psychology of uh, – the Greek pride is a complex and funny thing. And um, I'll speak as a Greek – uh, and I love the Greek people, and God knows they're gifted and, and wonderful people uh, with so many strengths and gifts from God. But they have to get off beyond this. We have a superiority complex, which is really re rooted in an inferiority complex. And, and once they get beyond this psychology, I think they can start to lead their own country again. And, you know, whether you go back to Ottoman rule or World War II, uh, the Greeks have this incipient belief deep in their heart that somehow they they're, you know, inferior. And they've got to get beyond it because they're not. I mean, that's the most ridiculous thought in the world. And, but until they get beyond that, I think they can't really take control of their, their own destiny and, and rise up as, as the strong people that they are, take control of their currency and walk away from these debts. I mean, there was a huge disadvantage the Greek government was at and the Greek people uh, when Goldman Sachs engineered these things on their balance sheet. I mean, they didn't have the sophistication. There was no way. And, um, you know, their response has been pretty much so every man for himself. I mean, they have a huge tax revenue problem. They're, they're under-collecting at least $20 billion a year. There's a small country, about 9 million people. Um, and they've got $80, million in, 80 billion, excuse me, in, in black money stored away in Swiss banks, that kind of thing. So there's no sense of the collective good anymore. It's every man for himself, and you, you just can't build a country that way. 
And, and so they've got to get beyond that. And I think they have to stop worrying about their inclusion in the Eurozone, recapture their identity as Greeks, uh, reinstitute their own currency, and, and get back to, to really healing their culture, because that's what they need. They need a tremendous amount of healing. But what I was going to say earlier is that Greece is a country where you can't walk more than a block without running into a church. Uh, if there has been a silver lining in this, uh, you know, you can't walk into a church in Greece and not find it full. I know that's not exactly an economic topic, but sometimes these things that we contemplate as suffering, they're really the hand of God on us. And if there's something good that's come from this, it must be this renewed sense of humility. And, and presumably something great will emerge from that for the Greek and people. And what about the impact for, on, you know, on our market? You know, let's say they do walk for the, you know, I mean, the market seems to... Yeah, I think you know, funding in the financial media have totally overstated the impact. Okay. You're talking about a small country with very small GDP. Um, you know, I, I think people, you know, pundits in the media and the financial media love to uh, extend the impact of that uh, to add volatility to bond prices and so forth. NBG, National Bank agrees, traded at about 34. Any thoughts on that issue? Stay away from all Greek securities. Okay. Uh, you know, okay. why go into a market that's filled with so much distrust and, frankly, corruption? I mean, a tremendous amount of corruption in the Greek culture and, and, and Greek uh, securities markets. Just keep your distance. Don't don't go bargain hunting there, really. It's not worth it. Okay. Let's talk about, you know, some of your big issues here. And uh, you've been a big position in Apple, a big Apple bull here. Uh, it just seems like it's just like a it's just like a ship in the middle of the ocean, just keeps chugging away, really doesn't get hurt on the big down days, kind of muted rallies on the up days here. Uh, nice support here in the lower 129. So uh, give us your take on that. But you, you departing with any of those shares yet? Uh, no, Joel, I haven't. Um, hard to find any reason to sell still. It really still undervalued on a forward uh, free cash flow basis, especially when you exclude cash. Uh, you know, important to look at some of the more subtle things going on with Apple, I think. People are fond of talking about some speculative issues like an Apple car or, of course, the latest product introduction, Apple Watch, which, by the way, we're starting to see them pop up everywhere. The company claims that uh, sales are better than all expectations. But look at some of the other things that aren't as often talked about. I mean, look at the rise of Swift, their programming language, for example. I mean, the thing is growing like weeds. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, gonna, it's probably going to displace Objective-C, which has been around since the 80s. Um, this creates long-term barriers to entry. I mean, and since Apple controls, of course, what gets into their app ecosystem, what doesn't, and if they control the programming language, I mean, they've got a tremendous amount of um, moat around their, their castle, if you will. And I don't see that going around away anytime soon. I mean, you can walk into any school in the world and you'll see kids on, on MacBooks and uh, MacBook Airs and iMacs. And so forth. They love those products. It's not going to go away. There's going to be an upgrade cycle, which is highly predictable. I mean, you can't replace batteries in these things still, like laptops. They, they really they diminish. They degrade over two years, and you're going to have to replace them. I don't see any competitive threat to their, their business. And, and again, you, you put on top of this these financial uh, dynamics, this enormous buyback. I mean, increasing, we've gotten so used to using these huge numbers, Apple, we forget just how big they are, but it increased their buyback $50 billion. If you just sit on those shares, your ownership in Apple is going to increase at zero cost. And uh, they're paying a very healthy dividend. So it's underpriced. I, I think upgrade cycles are highly predictable. I, I never understand analysts that come out and say things that don't appear to be very well thought out, like the smartphone market is saturated. I don't know anyone that owns a smartphone that's three years old, frankly. I don't think three years from now people are going to own the same smartphones they own today. Um, upgrades on an existing install base on iPhone, which is an incredible um, uh, business they've got, it's still like just over 20%. So really predictable free cash flow in the future. Uh, you know, if, there's two reasons to sell a stock, you know, Joel. If it's overpriced um, or if you've got a better opportunity. Uh, we probably, we might have some better opportunities than Apple at the moment, but Apple's still so cheap and so safe. Price target? It, it really price matters. target on it? Price target? Do you have a price yeah, target? Well, you know, I think three or four months ago I told you I thought 150 was safe, a safe price target. Probably higher than that now, looking at their latest numbers. Uh, they'll probably sell 50 million phones this quarter. That's an extraordinary number. Uh, they sold 60 million last quarter, as you know. You know, it, it probably would be fairly priced to one for around 175, 180. I think Carl Icahn's being a little aggressive, maybe a little bit speculative. It's hard to look out that many years. He's also counting on a number of speculative product categories. I think there's some errors in his letter when he talks about year-over-year -year comparisons for iPhone being difficult. I don't think they're difficult at all. I think he missed the mark on that. But you know, I think 175. You know, he'd probably be fairly priced around there, something like that. Okay, let's talk about another one that uh, 
you've had to tame a little bit more uh, geospace systems. Uh, you came on the show a little while ago. I think it was maybe at the $30 level, and this was before oil just fell out of bed here. And uh, the stock really took a hit, but uh, you just kept on buying in there. And uh, I'm not sure what your average price is, but, uh, boy, it's had a nice little bit of a rally here. Is it due for a little bit of a pause? I mean, it's hard to believe, Father, that this got down to 1495 and uh revisited the 22 level had another little pullback now we're back above 22 uh what's your outlook here for geospace systems yeah great great question so to answer your first question uh, our average buying price is about 27 and we have about 600,000 shares just under 600,000 which is close to five percent of the company you know ideally we'll try to get about 10 percent of the company and you're right i mean we wrote about it extensively in our annual report at 15 dollars a share it was almost a once in a lifetime opportunity i mean it was trading well below net current asset values. Uh, it was the ultimate cig- cigar butt investment, if you will. I mean, if, if it went into Chapter 7 liquidation, the common would have been covered like a bond. So you almost have like an equity bond situation. But I'll just talk real quickly about some of their science and why we're, we're big buyers of the stock, even though they're, they're running a deficit. Um, and it really revolves around the future of their, their PRM systems, their permanent well monitoring systems, which is uh, a science that's designed to mitigate the output of aging wells, existing reserves. And when we took a look at the company, we started to ask some basic questions. And that is, if this is sort of the future where we're going with this, you know, what's the total addressable market? And there's a company called PGS, which put out an estimate for the, the TAM at about 200 wells based on the life and the age of the fields. So, you know, if you estimate, say, 50 million a PRM system, that's about $10 billion market opportunity. And I think the fallacy in the market is tying the price of geoprices stock to oil prices, uh, which in the near term may very well be true because as oil prices re- retract, I think, uh, you know, CapEx obviously contracts as well uh, for a lot of the oil majors and their, their contractors. But in the long run, I think has very little to do the price of oil with judicious management of existing reserves and, and the EMP, which is necessary. Because if these large companies like Shell or Exxon or Chevron, uh, if they're not exploring and, and increasing to proven reserves, then they're technically in liquidation. I mean, they have finite reserves proven on their balance sheet. So if they're not doing that, the company's in liquidation. These are some of the largest companies in the world by revenue and by market cap. But getting back to the PRM system, um, you know, you're talking about a science that's been around for 25 years, and through papers, academic papers, interest, and programs, um, the science has significantly developed in the last 20 years. And so there's not really a debate anymore uh, about the benefit of permanent well monitoring systems. It's really a practical issue that's been recognized by Petrobras, ConocoPhillips, BP, Statoil, and they all accept the science. I mean, it's irrefutable. In the case of BP, they were one of the earliest adopters. Um, uh, you know, they're claiming now they're getting an ROI on their PRM system over 100% um, with only a five to seven year timeline. And the life of these systems is about 20 years. So, you know, at the moment, um, you know, I think that the oil and gas industry is having a hard time looking out one to five years, let alone 20 years. But I don't think that's going to be the case forever, particularly given the issues of, like we talked about, liquidation. Um, you know, you've got Stat Oil publicly claiming on their website that their PRM system, which was installed by Geospace, doubled the output of their existing wells. That, that's extraordinary. Um, and, you know, there's only been nine PRM systems installed in the last decade or so, and of those nine, seven were by Geospace. So I think it's unquestionable they're a leader in the science. They have the experience and uh, this judicious management of existing reserves. That having been said, uh, you know, somebody could come along and say, well, you know, Father, that's awfully speculative. You know, we don't really know what's going to happen to oil and gas. Maybe next year everybody will have solar cells on their roof and, and oil and gas will go the way of, you know, sperm whale oil, <laughs> you know, 100 years ago, and uh, which was displaced by kerosene, as you know. And I suppose anything's possible, but you've almost got what we could call like cigar butt speculation, because if you're wrong on the future of this science and its place in E&P and exploration production, you're still left with uh, a security which is valued below tangible assets so, um, and a burn rate which is nominal at this point. So uh, it's really deep value. It's a special situation. Uh, it, like all great investments, it requires patience. We've said from day one that we'd be happy if we realized that we were right after two years. We're about eight or nine months into that. Um, but even at 22 a share, you know, we, we're still buyers. I mean, if I can get – we were buyers at 17, at 16. We're just going to keep buying for the next four or five months. Hopefully we'll get 10% of the company um, because we really think sooner or later they're going to get another contract. And if we're wrong about that – um, you know, I still believe it's almost functioning like an equity bond. I mean, we're, we're almost basically secured, even in liquidation. Pe- people make all sorts of mistakes in analyzing that security. They, they're writing, 
they're writing off receivables more than they should be. They're they're depleting uh, reserves more than they should be on inventory and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of miscalculations there. So we feel very comfortable that principal safe. Uh, and that there's a really solid foundation, 20 years of science behind where this company's headed, and they're clearly a leader in our mind. Okay, let's move on to another one uh, that you had some good luck with, uh, shorting it the first time around, Legan Pharmaceuticals here, and uh, caught the nice break in it here, but uh, now, uh, whew, this thing looks like it's uh, moving up strongly here. Are you starting to build a position in Legan? Yeah, you know, we we did. We started reshorting it, and um, even though we don't like shorting because it's not uh, a favorable uh, way to operate from a tax perspective, especially if you happen to live in Massachusetts, which talk has one of the highest Talk about that a little bit. Talk about that a little bit, the, the tax perspective on, uh, on shorting stocks. and you know. Sure. So, yeah, shorts are always taken as short-term capital gains. So you can never get that beneficial uh, tax treatment with long-term capital gains. So as a, if you're thinking in investment terms, I mean, your tax is going to be one of your biggest expense items. So, and then if there's, a, you really get whacked twice if you live in Massachusetts, they have a 12% short-term capital gains tax rate. So it's the highest in the country. So it's not really in the interest of our investors in Massachusetts, which we have a number uh, for us to be shorting. Uh, but some things are hard to overlook. And, uh, you know, we just doubled our, our short position in Ligon yesterday, in fact. So our average short price is about 89 per share. And I personally think that, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now, Ligon could be used as a case study in academic settings of sort of the excesses of what the stock market's capable of. I mean, they've created almost a veritable um, like pyramid scheme of shell companies. I mean, they've got this IPO in Viking Therapeutics, and it's really fascinating what they're doing because they're IPOing this company that has really no prospect, almost no prospects of future earnings or revenues. It has no assets. In fact, it's just a tenant in their building. It's like just like a few people renting space in their building. They IPO this thing. It's incredible. Um, and their underwriters, you know, Roth Capital and so forth, are promoting this thing like it's going out of fashion. And then what they're doing is they're taking this ownership stake, which is about 48% of Viking, and they're putting it in their balance sheet to pad their balance sheet. And then the, the profits they're getting from the IPO, they're recording as earnings. So they're able to show these really great earnings. And then what they're doing, is, even though we're 48% earnings in the subsidiary, if you will, um, we're not going to record any of their losses on our P&L, even though this company is guaranteed to, lose loss, to have losses. So they're selling internal quote-unquote IP to really almost a shell company, taking it public, getting a massive fee for the IPO in collusion with the underwriters, um, padding the balance sheet, and then disavowing the losses. That's extraordinary financial engineering. I mean, that, that really looks, makes the Greek um, financial apparatus look like saints, frankly. And I think that it's unsustainable. So, you know, with the benefit of time, everyone's really excited about Ligon right now, and there's all these, they're attracting these sort of speculative investors, and um, for whatever reason, they don't want to, even though they have eyes, they, they don't want to look at this sort of thing. I don't think it's sustainable. I mean, they're not building a real product and a real business. They're 18 people. They've got almost a $2 billion market cap. Um, so I, I feel really comfortable if you're going to short something. That's the kind of thing you want to short because it's not sustainable. Okay. Is this your, your new short that you're working on, or do you have, a, uh, do you have another uh, issue that you're looking at? We've also been shorting another company recently. Uh, we've been shorting Skechers, actually. Skechers? Which really probably seems counterintuitive. And I'll tell you, we were long Skechers um, back in 2010, 2011. We were active buyers under $12 a share, and we had written a number of articles publicly saying that we really thought it was radically undervalued at a time when all the analysts, of course, were saying sell. And we were saying at the time maybe it's worth 40 to $60 a share or something like that, and we were buying between 12 and 17 As you know, it's over $100 a share now. The thing about Skechers, they're a great company, actually. I mean, they've been around for a long time. They have a really good ability to sense trends. I mean, these were the founders of LA Gear back in the 1980s. They've got extraordinary distribution and logistics operations. Uh, and above all, they're really a marketing machine, Joel. But there's limits on all valuation, I think. And the thing is that a company like Skechers, uh, which is primarily involved in the business of marketing, they're always going to be subject to the vicissitudes of, of preference, and so if you look at what happened with the rocker bottom shoes, you know, four or five years ago, it caused a precipitous fall off in share price um, and the related action taken by um, the various regulatory bodies against what they consider to be too aggressive marketing of something that really had no real value. Um, you know, they're going to be subject to that sort of thing again. I mean, their earnings are very, very inconsistent over the life of the company. So they're, they're enjoying an extreme run up right now in price. It's probably also related to short covering their, their short um, uh, has the percentage of those shares which are short have gone from something like 26 or 27 percent in December 2014 to about 10 percent now. Uh, but historically, if you look at their average price to sales, 
if you look at it on a discounted cash flow basis, I mean, this, this company should probably worth between, still probably worth between 40 and 50, maybe 60 a share. They're having a great uh, couple quarters. They've probably got a great couple quarters ahead of them, but this is not a company that's developing a better mousetrap like Nike. If you read the way Nike CEO speaks and you compare that to David Weinberg, the CEO and CFO of Skechers, you've got two very different beasts. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's always a place for a secondary player in every market. And that's been our thesis when we were long, which is there's a place for a company producing a second-rate quality product, but it should not be valued at such premiums. And the product has not changed in four or five years. I mean, go walk and, and go run on all these key product lines that we were buying at a huge discount again before we were buying it, I don't know, 70 or 80% of net current asset values in 2011. Uh, now, you know, this is a company at the end of 2013 was worth 1.8 billion. Now it's worth 5.5 billion. And revenues have gone up only about 25% in that time. And, and we don't think that growth in revenue is sustainable because they're not building enduring value. They're not building a moat like an Apple or a Nike. I mean, what Nike is doing, bringing in the, the consumer experience around the, um, the product and the way they're developing uh, innovation for athletes that they then broaden out to a wider circle, that's enduring value. I mean, that's a real moat. And it results in consistent earnings. What Skechers is doing is a valuable business. It's a good business, but it's not, it's not going to result in consistent earnings. And, and the result is you look at a return on equity of something like Nike, it's, it's more than double that of Skechers. So at 105, the wheels have come off. I mean, it's just insane. And so we said, well, this, this sneaker, the sneakeronomics, if you will, it's a bubble like small, type, small biotech. And uh, they're probably not going to be able to maintain that sort of growth out more than a couple quarters. And I think once mar the markets realize that, uh, they'd probably be subjected to pretty, pretty steep decline in value. I don't know if the market's dragging it down today or someone's listening to your interview here, but uh, it's went from 107.14 down to 106.01. Uh, before I let you go, uh, Brianna showed me a nice picture of you on a, on a motorcycle there. And uh, <laughs> I just want to know, where do you, what are you doing on a motorcycle like that? You're going to get hurt there. Is it a, is it a Harley Davidson? No, you know, Joel, that was an early anniversary gift from my wife. And I'll tell you, I, um, I'm one of those guys that's always had a love affair with motorcycles. Um, you're right, it's probably not the best thing for your health, but it started at a very young age for me. And I, I, I rode street bikes through college and so forth. And in fact, when I lived in Greece, and I'll tell you, if you can survive riding a Kawasaki ZX-7 on the streets of Athens, uh, where nobody wears a helmet, uh, God must be on your side. <laughs> But, uh, no, that's a Triumph Speed Triple, a 2014, and uh, I, I almost never will do anything for myself, but she uh, she's very kind and generous, and she said, you look, you know, uh, well, why don't we, she just, she really surprised me, and and uh, I've been thrilled, but you're right, motorcycle safety is a huge issue, and, uh, you know, only the most experienced riders who, who take the utmost caution and safety should uh, be riding, but uh, that's funny that Brianna found that, uh, but, yeah. Okay. Yeah, count me amongst those guys as a biker as well. <laughs> okay, real quickly, I had someone hopping in the chat here. I know we're keeping you a little bit long here. Chipotle Mexican Grill. Uh, Sheldon McIntyre yeah. has an opinion on this. As a, as a short, seems to be breaking down here. You got any opinion on Chipotle Mexican Grill, CMG? Well, I haven't really looked at the stock for a long time. Um, my son, and Matt, his name is also Emmanuel, he has a Charles Schwab account. He's nine. He always wants to buy the stock, and I'm always telling him, look, I don't think you should. It's probably overpriced. <laughs> But I will say to his credit, and he's got a really good mind for seeing these things, he owns Whole Foods and a few others, again, that I disagreed with, but I had to acquiesce and let him buy what he wanted because it's his money. Um, he, you know, he's always saying he wants to buy Chipotle, and he's pointing out constantly, you can't go in that place any time of the day and not find an enormous line. And it's true. And they have a high-quality product. I'm not sure exactly where the competition is. I mean, there's this movement away from the legacy uh, fast food places to these sort of gourmet. We see it in Shake Shack and so forth and the rest. But in the, in the Mexican food arena, I'm not sure where their competition is. So really hard to say. I mean, they've got a, better, a really good product. Uh, everybody loves it. Um, but generally, I don't really like food chains, frankly. Okay. I really don't. All right. So we'll have to interview your son next time. Reverend Emmanuel. Right. He's, he's, a, he's the new model. I think you'll probably get a superior opinion from him. <laughs> Reverend Emmanuel Lemonson, Chief Investment Officer of Lemonson Capital Management. Uh, boy, I could keep you on all day, but uh, we're running a little late here. Thanks a lot for coming on. As always, great interview. We'll talk to you again soon. Wonderful joining both of you guys. God bless you. And you, you do such an amazing job with your show. It's always an honor, an honor to join you. Take care, guys. Okay, thank you. Great compliment.